Good evening, everyone. I'm Shama Rahman, Marketing Manager for the New York Times Live Conversation, Performance, and Screening Series, Times Talks. For over 20 years, Times Talks has paired New York Times journalists with the brightest and boldest creative minds from the fields of film, theater, comedy, music, art, social justice, and literature. I am delighted to welcome you to tonight's event with The Daily Show alumnus and Peabody Award-winning comic Hassan Minaj, who is receiving rave reviews for his Netflix original series, Patriot Act with Hassan Minaj. Minaj brings an incisive and nuanced perspective to global news, politics, and culture in his unique comedy series, exploring the modern cultural and political landscape with depth and sincerity. Moderating tonight's conversation is Sopan Deb, culture reporter for the New York Times. Please join me in giving a very warm welcome to Hassan Minaj and Sopan Deb. everybody. Um, thank you so much for coming out tonight. Um, this thing sold out very, very quickly. Um, There's a huge wait list, all of it feeding my mother. Um, <laughs> thank you so much for coming out. Uh, I have a little bit of house cleaning I have to do before we get started. Uh, the first of which, we are going to do some audience questions after about 45 minutes. Um, I'm a very nice guy, but if you start your audience question with, this is more of a comment, I'm going to die on the inside. <laughs> So please don't do that. Please keep your questions short. Please be respectful of all the other people that have questions to ask. Um, please don't ask for a hug. Uh, uh, he is not here to review your script. So please be respectful. Um, yeah, and uh, I just, I'm just curious, who in the crowd has seen Patriot Act? <laughs> people are raising their hands. OK. Uh, oh, man. I believe we have a quick clip for those of you who haven't, which is not many of you. Uh, we have a clip uh, to show, I believe. Uh, so let's. <laughs> companies don't publish fairly, all right? They don't raise prices 5,000% at a time like maniacs. At the beginning of last year, drug companies increased almost all their prices between 1 and 10%. Drug makers raise prices the same way Chuck Schumer's glasses are falling off his head. <laughs> it's so slow, you might not notice. Why are his glasses always at fourth and goal? Like, they're just about to dive into the end zone. But those small increases add up. If you have a major health problem, chances are it now costs you a lot more to stay alive. Maybe the best example of how crazy drug pricing has become is insulin a drug that millions of people with diabetes need to survive. In 1996, one common type of insulin cost $21. Now, that exact same insulin costs $295. Supreme is watching this right now, and they're like, damn. <laughs> we should make insulin. <laughs> insulin is one of the most expensive liquids in America. A gallon of the cheapest insulin is up there with LSD, Chanel No. 5, in Cobra Venom, which when combined with a heat source, actually create Rudy Giuliani. <laughs> In the US alone, seven million diabetics need insulin injections just to survive. 23 million more people are also diabetic, including Ghostface Killa. Seriously, he's diabetic. Add that together with people who are pre-diabetic, and it comes to 100 million people. Yeah. <clears throat> All right. So uh, I'm going to start with an easy one. Uh, the show tapes on Wednesday. That's correct, right? Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Um, can you take? I me thought you were going to be like, "Do you have diabetes?" Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> um, so can yeah. you take me through a typical week of doing the Patriot? Can you take me behind the scenes? Do you start on a Friday to Wednesday schedule? How's how does the week work? Right. So generally, it's it starts from our working dark weeks, which is when we're not on air. We're pitching stories, developing the stories, tracking them interviewing people and sort of putting, sort of getting the train going for the season. And then we're basically culling stories. So out of any season, if we have six or seven episodes, we're tracking anywhere between 12 and 15. And then we have to cull it down to see what, what's going to make our sort of starting lineup of, of episodes. And so something like that segment, how much lead time do you need for that? So drug pricing was something that we wanted to do in cycle one. But it was something that we, we wanted to track for, we were just tracking it for quite a, quite a bit of time. And so um, 
that we'll put like we'll put anywhere between you know we'll be tracking it for about and writing and developing it for about six weeks. Six weeks. Yeah. Gotcha. Um, I want to go back a little bit. Uh, you talk a lot about origin stories, and I sure. wonder if you could tell me the origin story of the Patriarch. How did it come together? How did it first begin? Right. Um, so, so it was kind of interesting. In, in, in 2017, I, I, I did uh, an off-Broadway show called Homecoming King. And I did it off-Broadway, and I, and I did my Netflix special, and you know, did it with Netflix. And then I also did the Correspondence Dinner. And coming out of the Correspondence Dinner, and after the special came out, a lot of people were sort of approaching me. And they were like, hey, do you want to do a show? Are you interested in developing something? Um, but I knew that, like, I was like, if I, if, if I just take a deal, I'll just be in front of a fake city skyline, and yeah, I'll just be like Indian John Oliver. I'll be like, you know, <laughs> I'll, I'll, I'll just be in a suit, and I'll be behind a desk. And I had this idea where I said, well, I, I kind of want to combine all the elements of sort of having the political bite and the satire of what I've done on The Daily Show and the Correspondence Dinner, where I can talk about anything, any sort of political leader and sort of storytell, and have the sort of have the real estate to do that, but then also use the visual language and the stuff that we did in Homecoming King, using the screens, having the screens be like a character that I kind of communicate with, like Jarvis, where like, I'm, t <laughs> I'm, I'm, I'm telling you a joke, and then like the Ru Rudy Giuliani thing happens in real time as I'm telling the joke. But then I can, I can go to a news tear out, also go to a clip. And when I described it to people, it just, they were like, what are you talking about? And I'm like, it's kind of like a visual podcast. I'm like, what does that mean? So I was like, you know what, I'm gonna shoot it. And so we shot this proof of concept at the old Al Jazeera America Studios, RIP. And it was on 34th and 8th. Like, they're like, hey, you wanna use the space? And I'm like, what, why? And they're like, well, there's no Al Jazeera America anymore. It's just an empty space. And so Mark Janowitz, who was the stage designer and director for Homecoming King, built this stage where you know, he was like, what if you could use every single pallet of the stage? The floor was a pallet, the side screens were a pallet, and then there was a main pallet behind you. Um, and you would story tell on each sort of individual part of the, the screens. And so we, we start, started storyboarding, and we came up with the idea of Patriot Act, and I put together a loose headline, um, which ended up actually being our immigration reform piece, which was um, in season one. And we shot it, and I showed it to um, you know, a bunch of different places, and Netflix was the most excited, and they were like, let's, let's do this. And so Netflix's reaction was positive. Did they say, hey, what if, what if you do have a desk, and what if it looks like, like how, how did Netflix, did Netflix want you to change anything? No, it was one of those things where I, I just knew it, you had to press play on it. Just be like, just press play, it, it'll answer everything. How are you gonna do this? What will it look like? What will the stage look like? Well, what, are you gonna be, like, everything got answered through that. Mm -hmm. um, and so it was one of those things where um, I think their, a lot of their main questions were, okay, what's the scope? Are you just going to be focusing on American politics? Are you just going to be focusing on international stuff? Um, and I think they quickly found out that there's going to be a lot of things that we talk about. Mm. Yeah. Um, I want to go back a little bit more, which is you mentioned the White House Correspondence Center. Right. Um, I know a lot of journalists. Yeah. Uh, we are not known for a sense of humor. Uh -huh. um, and I, I disagree with that, by the way. <laughs> I, I disagree with that. Like this whole position that like, uh, journalists are bad and they're out to like get, I, I completely disagree with that. Uh, there's a lot of really, really, really funny journalists and our news thank, team. Thank you. No, no, but no, but our, our news team on the show, yeah. there's times where I'm like, damn it, they're funnier than the writing side. Like they'll be bringing pitches where I'm like, this is stronger than what we're pitching. Mm. Because yeah, the, a lot of people in the news side, and you, you probably know this, are super passionate at times kind of strange, which to me is very funny. It's like good fun for comedy, like just characters that are willing to go down rabbit holes and having a really interesting take and in perspective. Like, yeah, I, I, I kind of disagree with that position. So right before you are, I guess, approached about or, or start thinking about the Patriot Act, yes. you do the White House Correspondents Dinner. Yes. President Trump has already dropped out. Yes. Uh, how did you prepare for the show? Not, not the Patriot Act, the, the Correspondents Dinner. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So at, when I got the call, they were 19 days out. So a bunch of people had passed. <laughs> like, I was like, and did like, you want to do knew, it? Okay, I mean, my wife is here. She knows. Like when I told her, I was like, Bina, they called me to do the White House Correspondence Dinner, and she's like, something's up because, <laughs> like, Bina knows, because I was like, you're not gonna call the third most popular correspondent on the Daily Show. <laughs> Like, you, 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 it, how far down the ladder did you have to go? So I knew there had to be a catch. 
because James Corden had passed, a bunch of people had passed. James <laughs> Corden passed? Yeah, I'm putting it on the record. Corden, why didn't you do it? <laughs> a bunch of people passed because it was radioactive. He drops out, Sam B's doing not the White House Correspondents' Dinner, and the whole narrative behind the gig was like, hey, he's not showing up, we all need to do this, he's, he's already slammed the press, we should all not show up in protest. And then I, I actually did more research about the White House Correspondents' Association and what the dinner is about. They actually give scholarships and they award young journalists. They're like, so-and-so's here from UC Berkeley, they step up, I mean, it's just a regular dinner at a Hilton in DC, it's a very, Average Hilton. <laughs> like, we've all been in that Hilton. Like, we've been to bar mitzvahs and stuff there. <laughs> You've been in this Hilton. And it really is like a ballroom gig, like, to honor young journalists and people that are doing, like, good work in journalism. And then when I thought about it, I was like, that's great. We, we shouldn't boycott it. Actually, I think the whole thing has been flipped on its head. The fact that, like, oh, the cast of Scandal isn't here isn't a reason why we, uh, we shouldn't show up. We should show up because there's gonna be 15 to 20 students that are gonna get scholarships that are gonna be the next generation of like really great writers and journalists. So I was like, yeah, I should totally do this for that and then also selfishly to make fun of some of the most powerful people in the world. Mm -hmm. and, and how did you prepare uh, to do it? Like what, what was your mindset? Are there certain messages that you wanted to get across? Um, yeah, like for me, I, uh, I had a really great conversation with Larry Wilmore who had done it the year before me and he, he like said the n-word and dropped yes, the mic. Yes, right, yes, right. and he called, he, I called him and I was like Larry, and actually I called Larry and I called Sam, and Sam was like you should totally do this. Samantha B was like you need to do this. Then Larry was like, he gave me this really great piece of advice. He was like, you need to make this thing your own. So Seth Meyers in 2011 did an amazing job of delivering a very pure monologue. He's such a great monologue performer, like set up punch, set up punch. It's one of the funniest, I, I still think it's one of the funniest correspondence in her performances. Steven was great, right? And he told me, he was like, Seth was such a tight monologue machine. Steven's was such this dedicated um, character performance, you know, when he was making fun of President George W. Bush. And he was like, you don't try to imitate or copy them, make it your own. And so I kind of wanted to tell a story. And that was, that, that's what I, I did. I mm -hmm. sort of told a story about like, hey, journalists, you guys are the new minorities. Now you know what it feels like to be well, a minority. <laughs> that was going to be my next question. So you did this joke, and I'm going to butcher it, so please yeah, yeah, don't. Do, yeah, yeah. <laughs> uh, in the age of Trump, know that you guys have to be more perfect now more than ever, because you are, now, you are how the president gets his news. You can't make any mistakes, because when one of you messes up, he blames your entire group. And now you know what it feels like to be a minority. Now, <laughs> that's like, <laughs> <laughs> I, I did warn you I was butchering it. Yeah, yeah. yeah. You, know, uh, but, you know what that reminds me of? You know how like whenever you watch something where like on the news, they'll be reading rap lyrics, it'll be like, Kiki, do you love me? Are you riding? <laughs> <laughs> That's exactly yeah. what you did. Yeah. Um, um, but, the, but the line, um, but the line of uh, now you know what it feels Gucci like. Gucci gang, Gucci gang, Gucci gang, Gucci gang. <laughs> Says rapper Lil Pump. Um, <laughs> the, the line of now you know what it feels like to be a minority yes. is, was a very, very sharp line. One of the, shar yeah. one of the sharpest White House Correspondents Dinner jokes that we, I thought we've had in a little while. Um, do you feel that journalists covering politics in the White House understand properly the plight of people of color? Do they understand people like you or the people like your parents? Yeah, I think there's a lot of really, really, you know, at, at, you know when I was performing, there's a lot of other journalists of color that I saw in the audience. I mean, they, I, I, that line, I think, elucidated my perspective, but I think it also brought the room together. Yeah. Um, <laughs> there's some people that came up to me afterwards. There's, there's, there was this one like white lady, she came up to me afterwards and she's like, thank you for calling me a minority. And I'm like. <laughs> 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 but, but I think what I was, you know, elucidating was like, yeah, we, you guys, I understand what you're going, you, we're all sort of going through this, and I understand this uh, really, really sort of difficult position that you're in. Mm. And, and look, like the other 23 minutes prior to that, I was making fun of you know, MSNBC and CNN, and yeah, I made Wolf Blitzer laugh, that was really cool. <laughs> um, the framing of Patriot Act is really interesting because you tend to pick a topic 
uh, and you provide a, essentially a full explainer for viewers who may or may not have been aware of it uh, right. before. Now, how do you decide what level of depth they're going to go into on an issue? And, and I'm curious, like, who is the target audience for your show? So for, for, for us, I mean, the, the two things that we're trying to provide anytime we pick a story is it has to be something that makes people feel like, oh my God, thank you for saying that. So that's, you know, in the insulin clip you just played, there's so many people right now that are dealing with the insane sort of drug pricing crisis that we have that's going on in this country right now. Insulin rationing, it's really crazy, right? And that was one of those stories that I really wanted people to go, thank you for talking about this. Or number two, I had no idea, how did I not know that? I, that to me always makes a great story. Yeah. So like, for example, with the Supreme story that we did with Carlisle Group buying them and Carlisle Group being one of the companies that's like funding the wall, the border wall and stuff like that. I, that's a thing that you're like, oh, I had no idea. How did I not know that? I know about sneaker reselling. I know about this Supreme thing, but I did not know that. Those two things generally are, I, that's when I press go on sort of a story. And then in terms of how deep to go, um, Look, like the research dossiers that we have are really, really thick, but we're distilling coffee into espresso. So it's really about being judicious about, okay, what 22 to 25 minutes are we gonna pick here? Because we kind of have to editorialize. Uh, and then, yeah, that's, that's, that's pretty much what we do. Um, given that you're on Netflix, so let's say you have a topic that calls for 45 good minutes, can you do that? Or does it have to be yeah, cut can, off at a hard we, 25 or we, whatever? We can do whatever we want. I mean, I, I'm also very much performing in front of a live audience. Like, I can tell when people are, are like, bored. So when we do tech rehearsal, there's times where I'll be doing a, a headline at, like, 37 minutes. And around, like, minute 31 or 32, like, people are like, all right, dude, this is, this is a lot. Like, I, I, get, <laughs> I, I get you're passionate, but, like, I, I got to pee. Like, it's, <laughs> so it's, we've been able to figure out that sort of perfect amount of, like, okay, this seems like the right amount. Did you, when you were developing the show, did you talk to any of the other late night hosts? Wait, can I ask you a question? You can ask me any questions. Okay, now. for example, when you guys do the daily, right? Yeah. I always feel like the daily is the perfect amount of time. It's so perfectly designed for being on the train, ignoring people around you, <laughs> or like going to work. It's that perfect, or like you're, you know. Yeah, I love taking credit for other people's work. So no, but like, <laughs> yeah, no. But that is a great. I feel like yeah. the length of that is great. Yeah, I agree. I mean, no, I, I'm, not saying, you, I'm not saying that I'm not, and, you have, and you have to editorialize right. there, too. Like, I don't think The Daily works as well as, as an hour podcast. Yes. In the way, like, serial work is an hour podcast. Yes. Whereas, I, I think it works 20 minutes or yeah. whatever. Um, but I will pass that along to Barbara. Sure. Um, CC it. Um, <laughs> but, uh, did you talk to any of the other late night hosts um, in preparing to do, in, before your show uh, premiered in terms of preparing and what to expect? Yeah, I that? mean, I, I talked to John about it, and John um, Stewart, and he's really great about just, He'll, he'll give you notes that are more about like, like the philosophical choices you're making. So he's like, the thing he tried to encourage was like, just make the show your own and talk about the things you've always wanted to talk about. That you're generally gonna get things that are exciting and new there. And was that a struggle at first, making sure that the voice was yours? No, like it, I, when, I, I was hoping that he would give me like specific notes. Like when you go to Jewish Yoda, I wanna, <laughs> Like, you got to tell me how to wield the lightsaber, but he's very much about, like, no, Luke, like, <laughs> why do we wield the lightsaber? And I'm like, just tell me how to make the show, man. <laughs> but, <laughs> but he's right. Like, think about the things that you always sort of, think about the white space that exists. Like, everybody's talking about Kofefe or the wall or government shutdown. And to me, that's where we found drug pricing, Supreme, Saudi Arabia, like these things that are just on the front page of the Times that it's the bottom right part. Mm -hmm. It's like, oh, Bangladesh, no, nah, I don't want to talk about it. But, and then up here is Michael Cohen. And it's like, no, 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 let, let the other 18 shows do Michael Cohen. There's so, all, there's these, I'm telling you, the front page of the Times, there's like this and this that everybody else is just, they just forget about. They're like, China's a gajillion miles away from here. I don't care about China. But to me, I was like, oh my God, the Me Too movement in China has been able to beat censorship laws? That's really interesting. So you're when That's you're, the white space that so, I think a brown dude can fill. The, <laughs> um, I just thought it, that was cool. Right. <laughs> like, right. um, so when you're watching the Michael Cohen hearing yesterday, yeah. you're in your head, not thinking to yourself, ooh, you know, maybe we should touch this. What, what take or perspective am I gonna provide? 
that Twitter isn't going to give you, and that you know the the thing that I think our show provides is is depth and nuance. Like you can walk away from it and be like, okay, wow, in 23 minutes I understood sort of the drug pricing crisis in, in America or the student loan crisis. Like there is, I know what you know loan servicers are doing to students and how crazy that is. Okay, I I, I can understand that. Uh, to, I don't get, you don't get a whole lot. For, or for me, I don't particularly find it interesting to build 23 minutes around a couple gaffes. Right. Someone saying something stupid, you know what I mean? Um, one, one characteristic of your show is that it doesn't, I mean, it talks about Trump, but like occasionally and in a very oblique way, uh -huh. except for, I think there are notable exceptions like the immigration um, Correct. episode. But, but to me, and we, we have one coming out this Sunday on Trump and civil rights, but we're focusing on the Death Eaters, not Voldemort. You know, specifically right. the right. people around him that have enacted <laughs> all the policies. Um, so that was a conscientious choice. There's no Potterheads in the audience? <laughs> Damn, dude. <laughs> no, don't do, don't do it now. You guys are coming in. You came in delayed on the applause break. Don't do that. Um, that was a conscientious choice, I imagine, that was made That's early a, on. That was such a Times Talk reaction of just like, <laughs> hmm. <laughs> and, then the, and, the, and then the golf clap comes in later. Um, the, the decision to not to talk about Trump every episode yes. in, in the direct way that the other late night shows do yes. was, I imagine, I assume that that was a conscientious decision that was made soon after the Patriot Act was announced. Yes. Right. Um, but to me, Trump is the symptom. It's not the problem. Every, question, every episode we do mm -hmm. answers a larger philosophical question. So our first episode was um, affirmative action. Um, but the question we're answering in affirmative action is, is America a meritocracy? Mm. And if not, what policies are put in place to alleviate that, right? So the Saudi Arabia episode, why do we have this very strange relationship with Saudi Arabia? Supreme, what is the intrinsic value of hype? Like mm -hmm. each of these episodes, to me, it starts with what's the philosophical question mm. that we're trying to answer. And, it's, and sometimes Trump's part of the answer, sometimes he's not. Or part of the question, you mean? Yeah. Yeah. Sorry. Uh, yeah. And I'm, I'm just less concerned about like, what does Donald Trump think about that? I just really don't care. Mm -hmm. But I, I guess my question is, in the initial development of that, that it's probably one of the most important decisions that you made in doing this show. Uh -huh. Was there any pushback from other people that were like, dude, you're crazy. You can't do a late night comedy show and not talk about Trump that much. Uh, yeah, there was, but it's just like, I just do not care to give him attention. Right, right. I just can't. I spend too much time away from my family and loved ones to be like, sorry, babe, I can't hang out with you. I'm going to think about Kofefe for 16 hours. <laughs> I have to think of the best joke for this. Like, I'm not going to do right. that. Right. Um, pop culture is a big part of your show. Yeah. Um, you know, you reference Jordan sneakers and '90s basketball. You right. heard you make a Harry Potter reference. Yeah. Um, you know, uh, I'm a big basketball fan. I was telling him backstage, like, when he ma he made a reference to a, a, an old Antoine basketball Walker. player, Antoine Walker, and I was like, yeah. his show's doomed. No one's gonna, no one's gonna understand. And like three people in the crowd get that reference right now. Um, do you? First of all, so let me ask you two questions. First of all, how does the pop culture knowledge help you talk about politics? Um, like, do you feel like it helps you connect better with the audience? Is it did, how does it help you? Um, I just think that the news is very confusing and people are very busy. We have lives, loved ones, jobs, Russian doll to watch. There's just a lot of, <laughs> you know what I mean? Like people have shit to do. And so to me, it's like, I always tell people like the, the most powerful thing you can do is just how do you communicate something quickly and effectively to people? Like how you feel about something or something that is otherwise very esoteric. And I know sometimes people are like, well, that's, you're just, you know, you can't put everything in hip hop and Harry Potter references, but I'm like, you... not with that attitude. Yeah, but, <laughs> but like, I kind of wish there was more of that stuff out there. Mm -hmm. You remember the first time you filled out a W9? You're like, what is this? I mean, no. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. But, yeah. Right. Like, right. how many dependents of, do I? You know? No, I have no idea. I couldn't, yeah. Couldn't... You're like, is it three? But it, That's what's what, zero? I'm a tur I'm a turbo tax. Man. Yeah. <laughs> but like, yeah, being able to break something like that down is like important to me. Um. But you also make a lot of inside jokes. Yes. And, and I wonder, do you ever worry that that might limit the audience that you're reaching with your material? Um, you mean just like the asides? I yeah, think, or just, yeah. I, both, I, both in the density of the material you're talking about and the way you talk about them. Right. Because you also, uh, you know, you talk about the Brown experience quite a bit in your show. Yeah. You, know, you talk about, you know, you reference your aunties and uncles and you talk about things. Right. I'm, I'm watching, I'm like, wow, I've never seen that. 
I've never seen someone that looks like me, uh -huh. but um, but there's a lot less of me and a lot more of you know white people. Right. Um, so I guess my question is, do you ever worry that your material only uh, that your show only is appealing to a small smaller segment of the of the populace? Like, like that to me is the like the fundamental problem in the way this whole thing. I, I've been asked this question a bunch, right? Like, first of all, the platform. You know, I'm on Netflix. We're in 190 countries. And the headlines are on YouTube, which is really popular around the world. Like, YouTube is probably one of the most popular platforms in the world. If you go to India, if you go to Europe, like, everybody is on YouTube and watching long form things. And to me, that question has never been asked of any of my other counterparts. Mm. Like, there's over. There's more people with melanin who look like me in the world than the other way. But Steve, like Steven's never asked, like, how are you going to connect with the four billion brown people around the world? It's <laughs> right. ne it, the reverse is never asked of it. Right. But for me, it's like, well, how are you going to connect to, like, uh, that's ridiculous. I, I'm not trying to say, like, this is the start of the revolution, but there's more people who look <laughs> like me than the, you know what I mean? So that's um, the way I see it. I, thus far, I believe the biggest headline your show has made is with Saudi Arabia. Uh -huh. um, so, Netflix agrees to t a takedown request, essentially, right. from Saudi Arabia uh, earlier, earlier this year. Um, the episode essentially calls for reevaluating the relationship with Saudi Arabia. Uh, it goes deep on the crown, crown prince uh, and Yemen and their involvement in Yemen. Um, I, I think we have a clip from Hassan's reaction to the takedown. Can we play that? By censoring our episode, Saudi Arabia made us go viral. Have they never heard of the Streisand effect? <laughs> It was great for the show. I got 60 new IG followers. It was great. <laughs> this story got covered by everyone across the political spectrum. For the first time in my life, I was a bipartisan icon. <laughs> yes. <laughs> Liberals and conservatives. They both embraced me like I was money from Big Pharma. <laughs> Cory Booker just bear hugged me like, ah, get over here, buddy. Even Breitbart defended me, Breitbart. Do you know how hard it was for Breitbart? They would like look at a picture of me and MBS and be like, which one is browner? <laughs> is there a third option to hate? <laughs> so hard for them. Let me be absolutely clear. I am not a victim here at all. I'm lucky, okay? I have the freedom to call Saudi Arabia the boy band manager of 9-11. I can criticize my own government without any fear of repercussions. I can say Stephen Miller deported his own hair for being brown. I can say those things. <laughs> But those freedoms don't exist in Saudi Arabia. Dozens of activists sit in Saudi jails, many without formal charges. So while I can make a joke about being a cyber criminal, this is no joke for many Saudi activists. According to Reprieve, a human rights advocacy group, that vague cybercrime law that we allegedly broke, it is the very same law that is regularly cited in Saudi court to justify death sentences. We always get out on a very. Yeah. <laughs> Why do we, we always end on a very dark? Um, can we just can we edit it so we can end on the Stephen Miller joke? <laughs> All right. Um, so when you hear about the initial takedown notice, what were you doing at the time? How'd you hear about it? Uh, I was it was I was traveling, so it was actually my we my wedding anniversary, and like my phone was buzzing like crazy. It was because it, it was January second, and. I was like, oh my, what is happening? So many people are calling me. And then they were like, you need to look at look what's happening online. I'm like, what? And yeah, and then I found out. OK, um, so it was, you weren't it was able not, to get It was not a good time. So, <laughs> yeah. so you weren't able to get a heads up from Netflix ahead of it. It wasn't like Netflix called and said, hey, we got to do this. No, no, no. no you, so just, you just look like we were aware going into it that because, because Netflix is an international platform, we are aware that, look, you can, you can do particular headlines. There are certain countries that have different censorship laws, Israel, India. Saudi Arabia, Indonesia, Malaysia, they have, uh, Turkey, they have very specific sort of censorship laws. They've taken certain things down, removed certain pieces of content. So we knew going into it, this could happen. Were you well, upset with Netflix at all for taking it down? Because Netflix got its share of criticism as well. Sure, sure. Um, because it, 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 it is a business choice for them to operate in Saudi Arabia. And yeah. in, that, in the segment, you called for you know, the US government to reevaluate their relationship. Yeah, yeah. And I imagine that you must feel the same way about private companies. Yeah, I think the biggest philosophical question that I had to think about was, okay, this raises, this is so much bigger than just uh, my show on Netflix. It really is about the big five tech companies and how they're gonna interact with 
otherwise questionable regimes around the world. You have Apple, Google, Facebook, Amazon, and Netflix. These businesses are bigger than, they're bigger than certain countries. And they very much want to be agnostic when it comes to being in any sort of, they don't define themselves by country lines. They just want as many users as possible. So to what extent do you honor your core values? And to what extent are you, an, you know, an entertainment company that just wants to spread as much um, content as possible? Those are the questions that I think these companies are gonna have to answer. Ultimately, the thing that I have to answer to is, am I telling my story and how I feel authentically? That's it, you know? So for me, I'm able to go to sleep at night and be like, hey, I did my part. You know? Right. Um, have you had a segment that you've done, you've, you've, you've touched so many different topics uh, in, in the, I think, about nine episodes so far. Um, many of them go very directly at corporations and, and whatnot, uh, in one case, the administration. Have you heard from any, like, do any of the companies reach out to you? Uh, has anyone, like, uh, I, uh, was it Novia, the student loan company that you just went after? Uh, Navian. Oh, sure. Navian, yeah, 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 yeah. Uh, Like, has anyone ever reached out and been like, well, hey, man, that's messed up, like, why are you? So on, just, just, I'm just gonna make this clear because I know this is being live streamed, just so you know. Every joke that I said about Navient was cleared by our attorneys. <laughs> and I didn't specifically say anything directly bad <laughs> about Navient and Jack Ramondi. I said something that was legally allowed <laughs> according to our internal lawyer. Just want to make that clear. <laughs> <laughs> I was thinking about. I was like, "What did the lawyer tell me to say?" Got okay, got it. But like, you know, it's not like Stephen Miller. None of these. No one's reached out to you or reached out to me and be like, "Hey, either." No, hey. I'm more, I'm more afraid of Navient and Big Pharma. I'm just gonna be 100 percent honest with you. Uh, yeah, Stephen Miller hasn't DM'd me. No. No, not yet. <laughs> not yet. Not yet. Not yet. Um, so you have some interviews uh, that. Or, or short that are built in throughout the yes. programming. Yes. Do you want to do more of that? Do you feel, or do you feel like that's a little distracting from the format of the show? Like, what do you, what do you, what are your thoughts on? That? I want to do more of that, and you know, like um, in our, we just did this in our um, student loan debt, uh, student loans piece, where there were multiple field pieces within the headline, which I love doing. Um, I was a big inspiration for this for Patriot Act. Actually, was Radio Lab. I, I was a big Radio Lab fan. Prashant, the co-creator of the show. He really loves Radiolab, but the thing that I loved about listening to really well-produced audio podcasts was you can have a host narrate an entire story, then go into a field piece, then come back, continue to narrate, talk about the field, and then go into a different interview. I loved how you, you didn't have to break. A lot of the shows, you have to make a choice. It's either gonna be all desk or all Bourdain. You're like in the field. And to me, what I loved about Radiolab is that it can be both. And that's really what I want to do on the show. Mm. Yeah. Um, during, the, uh, you know, during the campaign, you were still at The Daily Show. And, yeah. and, and you've talked on the Patriot Act about your Muslim faith. Yeah. Um, when Trump was running for president and he initially announced banning all Muslims from yeah. coming into the country, yeah. this is the complete and total shutdown. Right. What, when you saw that for the first time, what was your reaction? Uh, I mean, I was genuinely shocked. I, I kind of had the same feeling that you had, where I was like, oh, he's, this is like self-sabotage. Mm -hmm. um, this is gonna, this is gonna, you know what I mean? This is gonna be the, I mean, he, he already did Mexicans are rapists. This is gonna be the thing that finishes him. And it, and it didn't, unfortunately. And so, did you like talk to your family about it or anything? Was anyone like, this is horrifying? I mean, like look, it was, it was so insane that I was like, there's no way this is gonna get massive support. And then it did. Got you. Yeah. And um, recently, um, uh, recently, uh, Elizabeth it's like, Warren. It's like, take 10. <laughs> Is that the reminder that's like, get up, walk? <laughs> <laughs> and I'm like, why are you leaving? And it's like 10,000 steps. <laughs> um, recently, Elizabeth Warren, uh, um, who uh, is running for president, um, she quote tweeted your segment about drug prices, and uh, she said, uh, I'm, gonna, I'm gonna read the quote here. Couldn't explain it better myself, so I'm gonna, uh, you know, that's why Congressman Jan Schakowsky and I proposed the Affordable Drug Manufacturing Act, a plan to bring competition to the generic drug market by publicly manufacturing generic drugs. Um, my, I, I was gonna quote tweet, weird flex, but okay. Yeah, right. <laughs> well, my, my reaction initially, I couldn't explain it, couldn't explain it better myself. She's really, she's really flexing. <laughs> what does it tell you that, a, a, a front-running presidential candidate 
publicly says that she can't explain something better than you, a comedian, did. Uh huh. Like, what, what, is it, what do you think that says, A, about our politics? What do you think that says about your role? Um, what do you think that says? Um, I think it's really cool that she watched the segment or one of her advisors watched the segment and <laughs> her social media team tweeted it out. I think that's really cool. Uh, <laughs> come on, man. Like, you really think, like, she's just like, 27 minutes? <laughs> like, what? Come on, dude. Like, uh, perhaps she did, right? And I think the larger, I think but, the larger but, question. I, but I hear the larger point that you're making. Yeah. Yeah. Look, I, I think that, <laughs> I think that it is important that we, that, you know, political culture has become popular culture. And that's a thing that didn't exist. Like, I'm, you know, when I first started doing stand-up, it, you know, there was just The Daily Show, and that was considered to be a very niche thing. And I remember going to the RNC and DNC in 2016, and MTV, VH1, like, they were there. I'm like, what are they doing here? But it has become this larger conversation, which I think is ultimately good. And so when comedians sort of shy away, when they're like, ah, we're just, we're just telling jokes, that's not entirely true, I think, in this vertical, political satire, what we're doing, we are providing information. Um, I think where people have it wrong is when they go, you gotta talk about this, it'll change the world. And it's like, relax, like, <laughs> that's not the case, you know what I mean? There, no song or movie or joke can change the world, but I think it can inform people a little bit more. You know, John Stewart, you know, when you talked about The Daily Show, and a lot of comedians say the same thing, you know, like a lot of late night writers and whatnot. They go, even though they talk about current events a lot, they go, I'm just a comedian. Yeah. You know, I'm not a journalist. I'm, not, I'm just a comedian. I'm, yeah. I'm a comedian first and a comedian only. Yeah. And John used to say, say the same yes. thing. Do you, watching your show, there's a lot of journalism that goes into this yeah. show. I have a slightly different position. Yeah. I'm, I'm, so, here, so here's my take on it, right? Yes, what we are doing is journalism. Yes, we have a very, very like astute and super smart, hardworking news team that provides every pull quote, every tear out, every data visualization, nerdy graphic that you see on the show. That's all them, and they check, they cross every T and dot every I, and we do our very best to really be airtight in our arguments. I will say this, though. For us, the necessary condition for what we do is comedy. Is it funny? The sufficient condition is, is it news? Mm. So when people come up to me and they're like, you gotta talk about Rohingya. I'm like, I can't make that funny, man. <laughs> so that's the difference. But for the news, for the New York Times, the necessary condition is, is it news? Right. The sufficient condition is, well, is it interesting? Will it get clicks? Will it get retweeted? So that, that's where the onus is wrong. When you're putting all the onus on comedians, where, hey, we, our job is to make it funny. We cannot make everything funny. So I'm sorry, we cannot be the news for you. That's where I think people put the wrong expectations on comedians. I've heard this position. This is the most insane thing I've ever heard in my life. People are like, if Jon Stewart was president, Donald, I mean, if Jon Stewart was still on the air, Donald Trump wouldn't be president. I'm like, dude, he was on the air and George W. Bush went back to back. <laughs> w held up the two MJ style in 92 when he beat, when he beat the Blazers. George W. did this. I'm shrugging. And Stewart was in his prime. Yeah. Yeah, and George W. did the shrug. What's been the... <laughs> what? That's what I'm talking about. Like, I'm sorry. Like, a comedian or a musician is not going to be the leader of the revolution. That's just not going to happen. So I, I will say this. This is the power of comedy and art. It has the ability to impact things in ways you can never imagine. Who would have thought Hannibal Burris's throwaway joke on stage in Philadelphia would have led to a jello perp walk of Bill Cosby? That was a throwaway riff. Yeah. He threw that joke away, and all of a sudden, it started this conversation around Bill Cosby. We knew, everyone knew about it for like decades, but it started this thing. Who would have known that an eyeshadow joke by Michelle Wolf would have led to a comedian not being invited to the Correspondence Center, right? So they have these effects in ways that you would never imagine, but it, it always won't be the, the answer or solution that you're thinking about. What's been the toughest segment for you to make funny so far? The toughest segment? Um, the what was the most challenging one to insert punchlines into? The toughest, I would say, um, was affirmative action in Saudi Arabia. Those were the hardest ones. We'd, I Why is that? About affirmative action is a really, really dicey, sensitive topic because 
I was hitting it at a, at a lot of different intersections as an Asian American, as you know, someone who grew up in a very sort of like competitive environment. I've had friends that feel this way. It's a, it's a very personal thing. People really have sort of the public face that they put on in regards to the issue and then behind closed doors. I've been in those conversations where people are like, I know why that person got that job or that gig. It's a very, and you can see it in the comment section. There's, there's opinion pieces in the New York Times and Washington Post. Hey, I'm an Asian American student, blah, blah, blah. This is how I feel about affirmative action. I feel like I'm being discriminated against. And then you click comments and there's 502 comments. It's nuts. Did it's you a get a response from thing. Asian Americans that were like, dude, how could you do that? There's some people that agreed with me. They were like, thank you. Like, I don't feel comfortable being participating in this wedge issue. And there's other people that are like, hey, I have this particular POV about it that I disagree with you on. Mm -hmm. But I just felt like with this Harvard court case, I wanted to say my piece. Mm -hmm. The Saudi Arabia piece was of just a personal decision. You have to make a personal, spiritual, you know, philosophical position that, you know, I, I have to live with the choices that I've made. Um, at the time Patriot Act went on the air, uh, several late night shows with a political bent were kind of, they were, they were canceled recently. I mean, you get, you had Robin's show on BET, yeah. the opposition was Jordan Klepper, Michelle Wolf, Joel McHale. When you were seeing all these headlines, and this is before Patriot Act premiered, was there part of you like, oh, I picked the wrong week to do this? Like, was there any, was there, was there any, did that shake your confidence at all? Like, how did you, um, especially given how crowded the landscape is already? Right, right. Again, like, I, I just knew that there were all these stories I was tracking that I knew really would touch a very specific nerve for a lot of people that just weren't being talked about. And I, I honestly felt like if, if I get a shot, I think I, think I could add something special. And, and even John told me, cancellation isn't failure. So just say the things that you want to say. Mm -hmm. That's my biggest responsibility is just honestly, just speaking honestly and, and telling the stories that I think are really important. Hopefully the people decide that it matters. Um, after you taped your first episode, I believe you said in the episode that your parents were in the audience. Yes. What did they say to you after? Um, I don't remember. <laughs> Okay. <laughs> uh, which, I mean, what did they say after? Um, I, I, dude, I don't remember, unfortunately. Okay, what about, what about when they first found out that you were getting your own television show? Because they were initially, when you were younger, they did not, yes. your father especially, did not think that you were, that going to be a comedian was a worthwhile uh, endeavor. Yeah. Now you have, you know, hit a... Big amount of success that a lot of people don't reach. Uh -huh. um, do they get it? Um, okay, I can't tell you what, like, what happened when like, the press release came out for the show, but I will say, I think there was a moment where I felt like my dad really got it was um, during the correspondence dinner, my mom and my dad were sitting up front. They were sitting like in the, I'm on stage and like basically where, where you are, there's like a, a, a round table. That's where my mom and dad were. My mom was in a sari, she was in a red sari, and my dad was like in a suit and, <laughs> Um, I could see like all the, t ch the chairs are turned around. So like his chairs turned around and he was on the edge of his chair like this. And so he's watching and then his legs doing that. That's the whole set, right? And then I get to the joke about, um, I get to, what is it? The, I get to the CNN joke where I go, uh, I make, I'm making fun of CNN and then I, I say how, like, how many screens they have. I feel, I feel like I'm like picking out a character in Street Fighter and then <laughs> That's some sort of joke, Wolf, like Wolf Blitzer. Let's go to the next. Let's go to the countdown clock for the next countdown clock. <laughs> and Wolf Blitzer, like he, he just he laughed like this. He was like, ha! <laughs> and he was like two tables away from my dad, and like he laughed so audibly. My dad like looked over, and then he looked and he was like, oh, he's like he's doing good. Like <laughs> he's like. He's like he's making Wolf Blitzer laugh. Because <laughs> the whole time Wolf Blitzer was like this. And you know, I don't know, you know people like journalists love Wolf Blitzer, but to me he's just, he's like kind of like a cartoon character. His name is Wolf Blitzer, you know? <laughs> <laughs> like, you know, if you're writing a script, you're like, oh, I need a news reporter name, Wolf Blitzer. <laughs> and so when, yeah, Wolf Blitzer laughed, like my, yeah, my dad was like, oh, man, he's made, he made Wolf laugh, you know? And I could just see him like kind of like easing a little bit. Do your parents ever give you feedback? Or are they ever like, you know, stand up straighter on stage or like something like that? Uh, yeah, they'll be like, why do you use your hands so much? Or, <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Or they'll be like, why do you do that stuff with your eyes? He's like, Hassan, do less with your eyes. You're always like. <laughs> <laughs> and I'm like, Dad, I look like you. Like, I get, me and my dad look very similar. I'm like, those are your eyes, so. At what point in your life did they 
get that this is what you were going to do with your life and that A, that you were good at it and B, there's nothing they could do to stop you? Um, the good at it thing is like, you know, that's subjective. Cause like my dad will be like, you know, it's really funny. Robin Williams is really, <laughs> he's really gifted and he can do all these characters. And I'm like, yeah, that's, that's true dad. Uh, but um, they knew that, I, I mean, I was gonna do this. I think it was right around when my LSAT score expired and uh, uh, <laughs> you know what I mean? Like I didn't apply to law school and we had, so that, yeah, I mean, I'll tell you that, that conversation we had, we had that in 2011 and that's really when they sort of gave up on me and they shifted gears into my sister. <laughs> and they went all in on her, and it's great. She went to Penn, graduated. I'm, I'm here to flex her LinkedIn. Went to Penn, graduated law school there. Worked at Skadden, big firm, right? It really worked out. So like, yeah. Right. yeah. Um, we have a couple, I, I have a couple more questions, then we're gonna do audience Q&A. Um, yeah. uh, just two questions, two more questions for me. Um, one is, given that your team generally stays away from talking about day-to-day -day news, with the 2020 election coming up, how do you plan on tackling 2020? Yeah, say? so I'll give you an example. Something that we're doing this on this Sunday's episode. Uh, it's focusing specifically on the administration and their role with chipping away and eroding civil rights issues. That is a synthesis piece. That you have to fly at 30,000 feet to say, what has Wilbur Ross, Betsy DeVos, Ben Carson, and um, Severino, what have these people done to erode civil rights in this country? That, you, you, we have to use a data set of a, a year or two. And then in the closing part of the piece, we talk about this, the upcoming census. And the census is, is, is definitely one of those things that's coming up in 2020 that is going to be one of the most important things that shapes the country for the next 10 years. It's stuff like that. What is a, what is a sort of a larger look at what bigger issue can we focus on and then dissect it? That's, I think, the, the way we're also going to approach the, the upcoming election. What are the big issues? And then sort of reverse engineering and talking about those. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, one of the candidates is Kamala Harris. Yes. Um, Kamala Harris is probably the most prominent Indian American presidential candidate we've yes. ever had. It's like, I mean, there aren't many choices, right? You have Bobby sure. Jindal and yeah. Bobby Jindal. Um, <laughs> Uh, she's also from California, uh, from Most your home. Prominent. Yeah, it's like yeah. there was her and Bob Jindal. <laughs> <laughs> um, do you think that Indian Americans in the country will view her candidacy in the way that black Americans viewed President Obama? Now, I realize that we're talking, There's, I think there's only like three, three million uh, Indian Americans in the country as right. opposed to a you know, far larger group of African Americans. Sure. Um, do you, but do you think in that three million that they, 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 the majority will flock to Kamal Harris in the way that Barack Obama gained the following? I mean, it's interesting. I think there's a lot of different people from the South Asian community that connect with different candidates for different reasons. Do you know what I mean? Like, mm -hmm. you guys know this on, on WhatsApp, on the internet, like, Bernie's popping. Yeah, Bernie is popping, you know what I mean? So there's people that really ride with that because of certain positions that he has, right? I think it really will be shaped by the issues of the candidates. The South Asian community, the diaspora, is very different. Different people connect with different candidates for different reasons. Mm -hmm. So I, I don't think it's gonna be one of those things where you're just like, going with the brown one. <laughs> I don't think it's that simple for, for the South Asian community. Um, we have a couple questions from Twitter. Um, uh, <laughs> Uh, the first one I, I, I'm asking is, um, who is your biggest inspiration and why is it LeBron James? <laughs> <laughs> Did I say it was LeBron James at some point? Or I don't know, but I think, funny? I think oh, someone's trying to be funny here. I'm trying to be funny. Who's my biggest inspiration? Yeah. My parents. Your parents. Yeah, my parents. Yeah, yeah. Um, why? I don't mean that as like, <laughs> I don't mean that, I don't, hold on. Uh, I don't mean that as a, I don't, no, no, I don't um, mean that as a prerogative. I, I mean like, they just they like, didn't influence you going into comedy, yeah, right? Like, like they didn't like no, just like just on some like life stuff, like, um, <laughs> just like where rubber meets the road, like a, a, a thing. Like me and my dad, you know, we had a lot of like what's a characteristic? Okay, I'll care. give you an yeah, example. Yeah. So we had a lot of Mufasa, Simba, butting of heads for like a lot, and we still do. And he's just like, don't go into the elephant graveyard, <laughs> and I'm like, but that's where the open mic is, you know. So we have a lot of that, you know. But like, there's stuff that I, I remember, like I, I saw that my father do when I was growing up that I didn't assign value to. Um, like the way my dad uh, growing up was always a peacemaker. Like I'm talking about with insane uncle and auntie drama shit, like in the living room, you know what I'm talking about, in-laws, this in-law, this Bobby said this to this, to, you know what I mean, this freaking, cr and he would do these UN peace resolutions, which were incredible to watch. Like he's balancing the, all these, 
conflicting interests. And we'd, we'd come out of the living room and everyone's getting in the camera and driving to the wedding. And I'm like, how did he pull this off? <laughs> you know? And then also, like, he's an incredibly decent human being. He immigrated here in 1982, and I remember he just graduated, uh, not graduated, he retired. He retired, he had his retirement party at his work, and so I flew in and I was there. And all these people that he worked with, uh, this guy named Bill, this coworker who, had, who was in the cube next to him, his name was Guang, um, Jesus, and like this guy, like, uh, this really young guy, like Trevor, he's in my age, these four people that worked with my dad, like all gave these speeches about him and how decent and honest he was. And I just thought about it, I was like, man, my dad has worked here for 30 years and the impact he left on people, they all were like, he was always on time, he was always polite, he was always respectful. And I just realized that's a really amazing thing and I, I, I would hope I leave that impact on other people um, if they knew me for 30 years. That's, it's just incredible. It's great. Yeah. Um, I think we're gonna do some audience questions now. Um, I believe we have a microphone. Um, okay, so I'm gonna say, just a reminder, please, 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 please be respectful to everybody. Keep your questions short. Uh, questions, no comments. Uh, you guys remember my, remember my spiel at the beginning. So I think uh, we have a stand on that side and a stand on that side, and just line up. Um, and then we'll do some questions. Uh, I actually have one more Twitter question to ask while you guys are lining up. Yeah, or, Twitter uh, question. Yeah, so this is a, I really loved your point in Homecoming King about the generational gap between you and your dad in terms of demanding equality as an American. Yeah. What are some ways to have these kind of conversations with older Daisy family members in a way that doesn't alienate them? Uh, you just gotta have the conversation. Like, you just have to. I, I tell people this all the time, like, with your parents in our community, there's gonna be two things, two major decisions that are gonna be your own, who you love and what you choose to do. Just Play your cards on those two hands, because you're going to have to live with those two things for a very long time. So that's what I tell people. Um, why don't we start over there? Oh, all right. This is going. Um, big fan. Love the show. Thank you. Um, also in the Black Cement 3s. Um, Thank you. Hassan, what's, uh, or Hassan, sorry. Yeah, yeah, no, no, no do it. Uh, do it South Asian style, baby. <laughs> <laughs> sorry, just a little nervous. What's the story that got away? What's the one that kept you up at night, or maybe you were nervous about, or at the time your production team killed, but you just know in your heart you would have hit it out of the park? There is a story that got away that we're gonna do in this season, so I, I don't wanna give it away, but okay. there's a story that's been getting away for quite some time, and we're gonna do it. Awesome. I'm putting my mind to it, we're doing it. It's gonna be, in, in, and it's gonna be in two weeks. Awesome. Yeah. Um, one of the things I love about your show is that it's not obviously leaning towards uh, any one side of the political spectrum. So like when you're writing material, do you say like, this is the left view, this is the right view, and we're in the middle? Or do you like just start from like uh, ground, like, like first principles and just build up a view? Yeah, it's pr the latter. It's just what, what is hopefully the objective truth and, and just go from there. And look, I have, yeah, I have no problem dunking on either side. <laughs> Thank you. Go ahead, man. Yeah. Uh, so I'm sure between Netflix, your lawyers, and um, every other person trying to regulate you, like how do you deal with people who try to stop you from saying certain things? Okay, so the lawyers are just like, you, just, you cannot say this, you'll get sued. That's fair. <laughs> and then I'm kind of like, um, all right. <laughs> you know? But that's a conversation. Um, and they're there to protect you. Yeah, and they're ultimately there to prote protect me and the show, and, and ultimately the reputation of the show. Um, and then in terms of like, sort of my, my, my approach, I've always approached things as like, I'm gonna be passionate and earnest and honest and just speak from the heart. I, I'm not trying to burn the building down and sort of flip everyone off. Like that's kind of not my style. It also wouldn't be authentic. Everyone would be like, why are you so angry? Uh, so I, 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 gen, I genuinely think if you just sort of, I've tried to approach everything from like a really honest, genuine place, it's gone over pretty well so far. You know, There hasn't been anything um, where I felt like, man, I really crossed the line. I, I, shouldn't have, I shouldn't have said that, you know? Good. Hi, so I'm not gonna lie, the story that got away was my first question. But, <laughs> the story that got away, okay. Yeah, next question is, uh, for talk show hosts in general, who yeah. are the ones that you really look up to, idolize growing up, other than John? Uh, I would say Steven. I would say probably Steven is one of the most gifted, just pure performers, like, you know, uh, like, if you ever played Madden, they have the quarterback rating. There's like speed, agility, arm. Like his ability to improvise, he's incredible. His, his, like his knowledge, just his just breadth of knowledge on philosophy, religion, politics, insane. 
And then just his character, who he is as a person outside of show business is, he's just like an amazing human being and he's an amazing father and uh, yeah, he's a huge inspiration. Thanks. Yeah, go ahead. Hey, um, in light of this notion of like a super fast news cycle and stories that kind of get swept down the river really quickly, uh -huh. is it ever frustrating to do an awesome episode on something that you're passionate about and then have to move on to a completely different subject next week and not be able to like sustain that conversation? You mean like I, I, oh, I, like, I really love the student loans episode. I want to do a part two? Like, like that's like a fear of like, oh, like people are, t like this is everything that people are talking about this week, but then next week they're going to forget all about it. And, you know, or do you feel like there's still a lasting impact from that initial kind of conversation? I, I think it's cool that we're, we like have this, this body of work and it's timely and timeless. Like you can still go back and watch the Supreme episode or affirmative action or immigration reform. It's, it's this synthesis piece. So I take pride in that of like, hey, this is something you can share with a family member or a friend. Just be like, here, here's the YouTube link, like watch it. Or here's the Netflix thing, go watch it. Like, um, so yeah, I, I, feel, I feel pretty good. And also by the time we do it, I'm, I'm like, oh, man, this is the 12th version of the script. Like, let's just do this. You know what I mean? Like I, like, I know a lot about insulin pricing. Like, let's just be done with this. <laughs> I'm not like, man, I want to live in drug pricing for another three months. <laughs> like, I'm, I'm good. Go ahead, man. Uh, fan, but my son Ravi here is a bigger fan, so if you can say hi to him, it would be great. What's up? <laughs> <laughs> um, so uh, I'm curious as a parent, what, what drove you while you were in your... You look great for a, like, a dad. You look great, <laughs> man. You look incredible. Almost 49, so... Are you going. serious? Yeah. Um, vegetarian life, folks, go with that. <laughs> he looks good. <laughs> Sit down, sir. You know what I mean? And you got the vest, like, you know. I should come sit up Anyway. You know I mean? He's got like the bonobos and then like he's got the, oh man. <laughs> sir, you're not, you're not gonna get to ask your question. At I, this I'm, point. Trying, I'm trying, trying to get it out. Um, so what kept you going uh, yeah. while you were early in your career and you know, you wanna be a comedian, but I'm sure there are a lot of challenges. You're bigger than life right now. I, I, I want to find out from you, what, what was that drive so you can inspire my son, inspire young people to know how to keep going at what you believe in? Um, what kept me going? I, I think, look, like, I, <laughs> I like, knew my limitations. Like, I knew, uh, I'll, I'll, I'll put it in terms that we can understand. I got a 1310 on the SAT, so <laughs> I knew where I fell, you know what I mean? Uh, in terms of like, but you know that's a good score, no, no, right? No, no, no. But like, <laughs> no, no, hang on, hang on, hang on. You don't understand. <laughs> whoa, 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 wait. You know I, what it not is. About, not about wrong. Like people are laughing. You know what it <laughs> is. That's our co that's our NFL combine. That's like, <laughs> like it's like, yeah. This dude has like a 18 inch vertical. There's guys with 44 inch verticals. <laughs> like, I was a D League player, you know, for academics. Like in Kumon, I was be a third stringer. You know what I mean? <laughs> What'd you get, like a 15 something? 1340, right? So you knew that like, all right, so Aisha, Aisha got a 1530. Do you know what I mean? Like she was dunking and swinging off the rim, like really, like she was really smart, right? My sister's really smart. So I knew that like, look, like I, uh, I'm not gonna be that, like the super academic guy and I'm really passionate about performing and what if I just put all of that work ethic and you know, I, and also, I was getting fired at all my other jobs. Like I, <laughs> like, I got fired from Safeway. I got fired from Office Max. Like, I just kept getting fired. And they were like, we think, hey, like, you know, you ever get the thing where they go, Osama Naj, come to the office, Osama Naj. And I'm like, oh, man. And I'm like, come to the office. And, and it's like, Office Max, there's not really an office. Like, you're like, dude, I got to turn in the thing. You have to turn in the little name card that says Hanson on it. You're like, here you go. And it's like, give us your key card. You're like, all right. So I, I shouldn't have a lot of options, you know what I mean? <laughs> Thank so. you. Uh, listen to everything by the far part, okay? Don't... <laughs> all right. Cool. Go ahead. Hi. Um, so one of my best friends, uh, Lina Unwer, just got diagnosed with uh, an aggressive form of leukemia. And I did the, I did the, yeah, yes, be the match. Did, yeah, yeah, which was amazing. So yes. um, you retweeted it a couple weeks ago. She's a fellow journalist. She's South Asian. Yes. Um, and I'm just, it was really, really awesome. And I'm registered. I'm registered. Yes. Yeah. <laughs> That's awesome. Um, yeah. So I'm wondering, is there any way um, that we could convince you to do an episode about bone marrow registration um, and the importance of minorities in general to um, register for initiatives like this? Because 
I think like as a minority, there's so much that I've learned about Be The Match and specifically about um, Lina's case that isn't really n known by minorities. And I'm just wondering how you kind of would pick an episode to do. Yeah, we'd have to make that, we'd have to figure yeah. out a way to make it funny. Okay. Cool. But it's like, what I, it's like what I said. Yeah, like it's like when people are just like, you gotta talk about this. It's like, all right, you know, there's all these stories that we're tracking. And the key is, is like, can we sustain it for 22 minutes and 22 to 28 minutes and make it funny, you know? But it is, a, it is an incredibly compelling and necessary story. I and, agree. And while we're here, the case we're talking about is uh, a journalist who's named Lina Anwar. And if you could just Google, yeah. um, uh, is, she's. If you want to make it. And go to bethematch.org to register. Yeah, that's right. Yeah. That's right. Yeah, <laughs> um, yeah and um, on, on, all in, on all social, it's trending as Swap for Lino or uh, yep. Team Lino. Yep. If you could register, that'd be awesome. Yeah. <laughs> go ahead. Um, when you have a topic that you're super passionate about, yes. how do you know how much to go for it and how much to dial it back because not everybody else is going to be as passionate as you are? Right. That's that I have with the showrunner, the head writer, um, and the news team. That's the, that's the back and forth conversation we have Monday, Tuesday, and Wednesday. So they just keep it's, it. It really is just like, people don't know this, or people, people do know this. And so we, that's a big debate. Like, to what extent do we, do we sort of paint the picture and set the table? And to what extent do we go, okay, everybody already knows all the characters that are here. Let's, let's go. And so um, that really has worked out from draft to draft. There's certain, ep there's certain episodes where like the primer is like eight minutes just to get everybody like, hey, I'm taking you to this whole new world. These are all the characters. And there's some of them where we're just, we're already off to the races. Like we can do it within three minutes and then we can do our analysis. So it just, it just varies case to case. Thank yeah. you. Yeah. Go ahead. Uh, hi. So I was just curious, being a comedian is your job. And yeah. that's, as I was sitting there, I was like, wow, that's really strange in that I walk into work some days and I'm like, Man, I don't. I'm an actuary. I don't. I don't know how to be an actuary today. Kind of. So, do you ever feel like weird pressure to be just funny all the time? Like I was sitting there thinking, like, ah, oh, how can I ask you a question? I was like, well, uh -huh. what's the normal person kind of question I can ask? So. Okay, <laughs> <laughs> uh, <laughs> Dude, life is awesome. Um, well, is it tough being funny all the time? Do you feel, I'm are not, you, all right, let me, okay, do you, okay, if I can, if okay, I can, yeah, do you, do you, are you on all the time? Like when you're, when you're, when you go home tonight, yeah. are you, are you always cracking jokes? Are you? No, uh, no, not really, no. No. Yeah. Actually, <laughs> yeah, no, I'm not really cracking jokes, yeah. And my, and my wife would argue, she tells me this all the time, she goes, you're not very funny. <laughs> like, Bina tells me that all the time, and I'm like, who's funny? She's like, Roy Wood Jr. is really funny. <laughs> And he is, he's so funny. Uh, I think like I'm situationally funny or like if I write it down and perform it, then I can be funny. But like in general, I'm not particularly funny. <laughs> yeah. Go ahead. Hi, um, so I have two questions. So the first one is, um, is there one topic that you don't want to discuss at all that's like off the table for you? And then the second one is, um, like in your show and also in Patriot Act, in um, Homecoming King, you discussed somebody named Nyla Auntie, and uh, I'm very curious as to who she actually is. I mean, I said the name. <laughs> I don't like, is she like a relative or something? Say what? Like, is she like a relative or something? Because you like mentioned her like five times. I was just very curious, like, who they actually were. Like, I mean, like, no, like, it actually isn't a, a, a real person, but I just looked at different auntie names, and <laughs> it just. It's just like it really like ah uh, it just this is like this is like when you find out that wrestling's not real. Yeah, no, but there 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 was a, like a, there's like a distant distant Nylonti that like I met at a party, but at like a family davit. But like when you just look at names, there's certain names that I'm like that's a really it just sounds really great. And so yeah, you, I just went with Nylonti. And then is there like a topic that you absolutely don't want to discuss? Like a topic that I don't want to discuss. Um, Generally, any topic that we don't want to discuss just doesn't have enough, like, there's not enough sort of comedic fodder, tape, just stuff that it, like, the foundational elements it takes to build out a complete story. That's it. Awesome. Thanks. Yeah. Thank Go you. Ahead. Hi. Hi. Um, so I had a daughter around the same time as you and your wife, and I'm uh -huh. wondering if um, having a child has, like, changed or prior di prioritized different stories for you? Have different things become more important to you because now you have a kid? Um... You know, I, the biggest thing that it's affected, it, and you probably know, is like, it's just time. And so it's one of those things where if I'm gonna devote time to something, it, it just has to matter. Because I'm spending a lot of time away 
from my wife, my daughter, my family, like it's just gotta be worth it. So it, it just it, it having that like level of time. Um, and that, that's been the big thing. So anything that I talk about on the show, I think it's just, it's just worth my time and worth being in the office that long. Yeah. We have time for two more. Two more, all right. Uh, sorry, uh, you talked about how, in, uh, how you put entertainment first when making the show. Yeah. And we wa we, we've watched your show in school, like in class. My teachers have shown it. Are you serious? Yeah. So I was No, are you, like, you're not, you're joking, right? Yeah, like in AP classes we did that okay what which episode like uh, which, the Saudi Arabia one so your teacher yeah went to the computer and was like <laughs> yeah, yeah plugged in the HDMI well we have a smart board but yeah say what we have a smart board but yeah okay <laughs> <laughs> okay <laughs> and was like I'm not teaching just we just let's just watch this comedy show yes yes and it was the main teacher or the substitute teacher <laughs> Uh, yeah, shout what's out it, what was Wright. His, what's, what's, his name? what's his name? Miss Wright. Miss, Miss Wright? That's not a good name. You know what my favorite name that we used on the show? <laughs> Mr. DeLugas. That's a good name. <laughs> See how there's funny names like Mr. DeLugas? That's a fun, like, it just sounds funny. Or like Mrs. Caldwell. That's a great, like don't you already imagine like a librarian with a brooch? <laughs> there's certain names that are funny. Iqbal, that's also a funny name. It's like Iqbal, like Iqbal uncle. You're like, I know an Iqbal uncle. <laughs> All right, go ahead, sorry. So do you think that's like an appropriate setting to view your show? <laughs> uh, all right, you know what? I think it's great. I think it would have been even cooler if the teacher had assigned it and then gotten the class of 30, hopefully. Like 25. 25 yeah. to watch it at home. Then it would have really helped the show out. <laughs> You know what I mean? Like, All right. I need those views. We have give time those, for one me me more. Views. I'm so sorry. One more question. What's good, Hassan? What's up? So, uh, when you started Open Mic, you were saying, like, did you ever get booed often? Did you get, like, tomatoes thrown at you once or twice? Oh, yeah. Like, like how did that go? Uh, you want me to tell you the worst bombing story? Yeah, that's it. That. So, 2009, Baltimore Community College, right? Uh-huh. They're Community like, I, there's this thing called NACA. You get booked to do all these, like, college gigs, right? So, basically, it's like, um, you go, you go to this event, all these like, all these, uh, it's like SUNY schools, like SUNY Oswego, uh -huh. SUNY Albington, like all these like schools you've never heard of, they're there uh -huh. <laughs> to book talent to perform in the cafeteria at their, because uh, they have like these lunchtime shows. Uh -huh. And um, I got booked to perform at Baltimore. You, you perform like a five minute set there and then you get booked for the year. So you'll be like, April 29th, I'm doing Baltimore Community College. May 8th, I'm doing SUNY Albington or whatever. Doing on tour, right? Catch me live, right? <laughs> and I got, I got booked to do this thing at Baltimore Community College. And I was like, I got to make this gig. It was, it was snowing. They're like, hey, we, we, we may have to cancel the gig. I'm like, I need this money for rent. Like, we cannot cancel this. I, the show must go on. Ah. And I was kind of like, I was kind of worried where I was like, uh, what time's the show? They're like, it's at 11 o'clock. I was like, at night? They're like, AM. And I'm like, all right. <laughs> and they were like, and I'm like, are you sure people are going to show up? Because it's 11 AM on Friday. Oof. Oof. And it's, it's a commuter <laughs> school, right? And they're like, no, like, our marketing department really worked hard on it. <laughs> and so I'm like, cool. And I get to the school, and I, I'm walking down the hallway to where the cafeteria is. And there's just these like, uh, like huge cutouts of my head. You know, like Bad in the hallway, and it's like, you know, comedian, 11 a.m., Friday. And then I turn the corner, and I get to the cafeteria, and no one is there. Wow. And I look at, there's all these round tables, and there's like, every, there's all these round tables, and on each of the round tables, there was like a little, like, folded cutout of my face, like, comedian, 11 a.m. You know how, like, Facebook gives you analytics of, like, how popular your commercial is. So it'll be like, you connected with 30% of your fans. My face connected with 0% <laughs> of Baltimore Community College. And so the lady's like, hey, it's OK. You can go home. And I'm like, I really need, okay. I'm re I really need to perform. And she's like, <laughs> so she OK. So she basically sat where Sopan, yeah. <laughs> Sopan is sitting. And I did the full-on performance. and. It was really quiet. Like I could hear the echo of every joke, <laughs> and um, 
the, in the, like 20, 25 minutes in, the janitor came in <laughs> and he was like, he popped it in and he's like, oh, did I interrupt the audition? <laughs> like he thought I was like performing for the school play. And I'm like, no, 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 it's a show. Like it's a show. And he's like, this is a show? And I'm like, yeah, man, like it's a comedy show. And he was like, all right, man, I'll sit down. And so he like brought his mop in, he put it to the side. And he just watched the, uh, the, like, the 30 minutes. And um, he's like, look, man, like, stick with it. You tried really <laughs> And that was, uh, that was one of the worst times of my life. You've been flourishing ever since, huh? Uh, say what? You've been flourishing ever since. Yeah, oh, but there, then there was another time, where, like three schools later, I was Still performing. Bomb. Different and, and it was like 20 minutes into the set, and I was bombing. And then the, the coordinator of the, the, the gig, uh -huh. Just from the audience, she was like, you can stop. <laughs> and I thought I was getting heckled, and I'm like, screw you. And then I was like, oh, this is like the programming director. <laughs> and she's like, you can, you can just stop. Um, yeah. Thank you so much. Thank you. Um, thank you. A big hand for Hasan Minaj, everybody. Thank you. That was fun. Good thank you, me. brother.